Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to share a screen. Okay. Morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. So it, it's on, on morning on two twenty eight in the books and on here what's well, on the screen. We have an overview of Passover because this is like going to be a Passover, a, uh, a an insight into Pesach into Chomet into Matzah and Chomet. So the, the holiday overview is like this, just to give a, a general thumbnail sketch. What is Passover? The eight-day festival of Passover is celebrated in the early spring from the 15th to the 22nd, thank you very much, of the Hebrew month of Nisan. It commemorates the emancipa emancipation of the Israelites from slavery in ancient Egypt. And by following the rituals of Passover, we have the ability to relive and experience the true freedom that our ancestors gained. Story in a nutshell. After many decades of slavery to the Egyptian pharaohs, during which time the Israelites were subjected to backbreaking labor and then unbearable horrors, God saw the people's distress. It sounds like he didn't see it before, but God responded to the people's distress and sent Moses to Pharaoh with a message. Send forth my people so that they may serve me. But despite numerous warnings, Pharaoh refused to heed God's command. God then sent upon Egypt 10 devastating plagues, afflicting them and destroying everything from their livestock to their crops, which loosened their hold on the, on the Israelites. At the stroke of midnight on of the 15th of Nisan, 15th of Nisan will be will begin this coming Wednesday. We know we start our calendar day begins at, at night, right? Right? Konidre, Friday night, and so on. So the night of the say that this is is the beginning of the fifteenth of Nisan. That's every year the fifteenth of the Hebrew month of Nisan is the first day of Pesach, and this happened in the year twenty four forty eight from creation, which okay. is thirteen thirteen BCE. God visited the last of the ten plagues on the Egyptians, killing all their firstborn. While doing so, God spared the children of Israel, passing over their homes, so to speak. Hence the name of the home. Pharaoh's resistance was broken and virtually chased his former slaves out of the land. Because he said, get out here. It, eventually he realized, and other people realized, holding on to them was just service. And he, he chased them away. The Israelites left in such a hurry, in fact, that the bread they baked as provisions for the way did not have time to rise. It wasn't like they, they, they had to run because they were escaping. They were chased out. Just go, 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 get out. 600,000 adult males, plus many more women and children. So you're talking about probably about 2 million people somewhere in that area range, left Egypt on that night and began the trek to Mount Sinai and their birth as God's chosen people. Passover observances. Passover is divided into two parts. First two days and the last two days, which and the latter two days commemorate the splitting of the Red Sea. And this is going to be on 229. Let me just go down a little bit here. Can you take down the... Yeah, I'm going to do that here. If my mouse would work, it would be a little easier. But here, how do I do this here? All right, let me just do it here. Okay. Thanks for reminding me. Right. And the, the latter commemorating the splitting of the Red Sea, are, they are full-fledged holidays. Holiday candles are lit at night. And Kiddush and sumptuous holiday meals are enjoyed on both sets of nights and days. First two days, last two days. In Israel, it's first day, last day. We don't go to work, drive, ride, switch on or off electric devices. We are permitted to cook and carry outdoors. The middle, other, other, not like a regular Shabbos. The middle four days are called Chol Hanoid, semi-festive intermediate days when most forms of work are permitted. Now, to commemorate the unleavened bread that the Israelites ate when they left Egypt, we don't eat or even retain in our possession any chametz, chametz means leavened products, from midday of the day before Passover until the conclusion of the holiday. Now, those from Tuesday afternoon. Chametz means, or late morning, chametz means leavened grain, any food or drink that contains even a trace of wheat, barley, rice, oats, and spelt. That's going to be, we're going to be zeroing in on that today. What makes matzah matzah? What makes chametz chametz? And what's the, the significance, spiritual significance we can derive from that? So chametz is something that has that comes from wheat, barley, rye, rye or those oats per spelt, and is not guarded from leavening our, our fermentation. Because any those those grains, when they become 
uh, wet, they will naturally ferment. This includes bread, cake, cookies, cereal, pasta, and most alcoholic beverages. Moreover, almost any processed food or drink can be assumed to be chametz unless certified otherwise. Reading our homes of chametz is an intensive process. It involves a full-out spring cleaning, search and destroy mission during the weeks before Passover, and it culminates with a ceremonial search for chametz on the night before Passover this coming Tuesday evening, and then a chametz burning ceremony on the morning before the holiday, which would be Wednesday morning. Chametz that cannot be disposed of can be sold to a non-Jew for the duration of the holiday. We can do it through our website. We'll take care of it for you. Instead of chametz, we eat matzah, flat unleavened bread. It is a mitzvah to partake of matzah on the two Seder nights. One of the mitzvahs of, of Pesach is to eat matzah at, at the Seder. And during the rest of the holiday, it's optional. The highlight of Passover is the Seder. Observed in each of the first two nights of the holiday, the Seder is a 15th step family-oriented tradition, and a ritual-packed feast. Okay. Now, let's get into the, the matzah. <laughs> what makes the matzah matzah? Text one. Do not, the, the Torah tells us, do not eat leavened bread with the Paschal lamb. There's an offering that was brought for thousands of years and has not been brought for the past 2,000 years because we don't have a temple. It was a Paschal offering. It was a lamb, generally, or a goat. And if the Torah says, don't eat leavened bread with the Paschal offering. Rather, eat matzah. And matzah has a, 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 a moniker. It's the bread of the pauper, the poor person. Eat that with your Paschal offering, eat that for seven days because you left the land of Egypt in haste. In other words, later on, elsewhere, the Torah says, don't eat leavened products, what we call chametz, but here it's talking about eating matzah. This will help you remember the day you left the land of Egypt, all the days of your life. So we have matzah. We're told that this is something that um, we, we need to eat. And, we have to, uh, and elsewhere, also it says we have to guard to make sure that it, it stays matzah because of something as we're going to talk about, something to, to stay in matzah form is, if, depending on the type of grain, it, that's a challenge. Because if you have uh, wheat, it, it get wet, moisture, whatever, it will start to ferment. And okay, we, before you get too far from the question, go ahead. two questions for you. Number one, is buckwheat considered comet? Um, that's a good question. I never, I don't know. Is it what? What is buckwheat essentially? What, uh, what, buckwheat is kasha. No, that, that kasha part I know. What? What is that? A scientific term? No, that's <laughs> the term that my grandmother. Used. Mine, mine, mine too. <laughs> I'm not sure what buckwheat is. We, I, it's easy to find out. I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah. Okay. Also, uh, considering that they bake presumably enough matzah to get to Mount Sinai. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, why would they have baked and not enough for the trip? Well, they were going to bake, and then they were they were in the middle of baking for the trip. Mm -hmm. It was early morning, and then and the, the Egyptians came and said, "Get out! You, know, <laughs> you, you don't, you can't, you, you can't just uh, prepare." Yeah. You have to. Yes, they were they were packing, <laughs> and and because they had already, they had been told two weeks before that for the evening meal they were going to have to have matzah. So they mm -hmm. baked matzah already. But then they ate. And now they're leaving a few hours later. So they're baking more provisions. Was not able to, to, uh, to rise. That ended up matzah too. So the first matzah, the matzah of the evening of the 15th, in other words, the Wednesday night meal was deliberate. The matzah of the middle of the night, this year would be Thursday morning. It was then a Thursday morning. Also, that meal, those, that matzah was not deliberate. That was because they had to. It was leftovers. It was. It, it wasn't leftovers. They. It was finished, but they was. But they wanted to make it into bagels or to, the Wonder Bread, and and they they had, they had to rush. Okay. Now, so we we also want to point out that there's something the mass is called a a pauper's or a poor person's bread. Now, text two. In. Text two is from the Talmud, because the Talmud does an analysis of the different verses, and it, it, it says here, and it's it, it's not totally complete actually, as they as they um, 
they put it down here, but um, it, it, it'll work. The verse states, do not leave, eat leavened bread of the Paschal lamb, rather eat matzah, the bread of affliction. You have to eat matzah. Now, what the Talmud says is that by juxtaposing the prohibition of eating leaven with the obligation to eat matzah, Torah tells us that matzah must be capable of leavening, that we must prevent the leavening. Torah, the, there are a few different angles into this. The Talmud says it needs to be a type of, of flour that could theoretically be leavened, could become hummus, but you don't allow it to. In other words, it takes our active intervention to make sure that it doesn't. So that's why there's, in a matzah bakery, they're, they're working very, very quickly. We keep everything very far, you know, we're very careful to keep it away from moisture. Once it hits the water, where there's, there's, you're on the, on the speed. That there's a prescribed time. Under 18 minutes. Yeah, yeah and it's, it goes, it, it's, it's very, very quick. And the reason for that is because you, you don't want to leave it to a uh, uh, time to rise. Someone asked something in the chat. I just want to finish this thing to one more paragraph. This excludes pseudo grains such as rice, millet, and the like. I don't know if buckwheat is a pseudo grain. Never heard of a pseudo grain. They can only come to a state of decay, but not to a state of leavening. Even if water is out, you can have rice flour, and there are possibilities. But and even some level of rising, but there's not the, the chemical fermentation. That's what we want to stay away from. Okay. Has there been a discussion on the mission of Talmud whether this restriction could be interpreted to, to be limited specifically to eating in combination with Pascal Lamb rather than how it is broadly interpreted? Great question, because the way it was translated here and it's framed here, that's what it said. It's, it's about eating together with Pascal Lamb. El, elsewhere, other areas in the Torah, it's very it, it's it's really not so closely hinged, and it's um it's quite obvious in the Talmud that that's not the way it is, that it's it's um, connected to the Paschal offering. The murder is, and that's why the murder today is, is not considered uh, a bit, it's it's a rabbinic institution, but it's not a biblical commandment, even though it, the Torah talks about murder, but Torah really makes it as specifically together with the, the Paschal offering, so it's not considered a biblical a, a commandment today. But the matzah is. Because of the way it's framed elsewhere, I and I understand the question because the the, the way it was framed here, it, it seems um, contingent on it. It's not okay. So we, what we're saying is there are five types of of grains that can ferment, and therefore, since they can ferment, they can become leaven. They can become what we call chametz. Then those are the ones that are appropriate matzah, because it's. It could have you you intervened that it not be. What are those? Those are wheat, barley, spelt, rye, oats. Other ones are can't become chametz, even if they rise, because the, the chemical fermentation is not going to happen. Now, there's another way that even let's say wheat can't become chametz, and this is through what liquid you put in it. Text three. Also from the Talmud, when we say that something is a, a poor person's bread, what's it trying to tell us? What do the per, poor person's bread words, poor person's bread imply? It excludes dough that was kneaded with wine, oil, or honey, or fruit juice. If you look in, in text four, the rich person's matzah, it's called the rich person's matzah. This says two types of matzah. <laughs> you walk into the shop, right? It, it all looks the same to you. But the one that's made purely with water is called a poor person's matzah. The one that's, if it's made with fruit juice, it's called a rich person's matzah. Why is it, what does it mean? Because there's more taste to it. Now, I would add, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't go down. I would add, fruit juice is in that even my teachers I had who came from Eastern Europe, the idea that we would squeeze an orange for its juice and then throw out the rest was so extravagant. It was, it was like, how do you do that? You're throwing away food. So fruit juice was considered, even in, in my, my parents' lifetime, depending where you live, it was considered a, a, a more of a, a, a rich person's type of drink because you had you were able to, to, to just take 
something that's relatively minimal in it and throw away the, the, you know, the goal. So what we have is two different types of, of matzah. One is the, 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 uh, from the five grains that can ferment and only with water. That's what we're going to call a poor person's matzah. And then there's another type of matzah, which is not a poor person's matzah, but it's called more a wealthier matzah. And it's rich in taste, at least. And that is where it's made either with honey, wine, oil, or fruit juice. Now, what does this mean for us? What does this all mean? These are just details of the law. So let's get to what's the problem with hummus. Hummus is not evil. Bagels are good. What, what's the symbolism in the chametz that wants the, that this holiday is so careful about trying to drive home to us, it's an exercise. Past, every holiday is an exercise, trying to drive home a, a, a lesson to us, a psycho-spiritual lesson, which we want to take with us after the holiday for our own growth. So eating bread is not a bad thing. Challah is not a bad thing. Bread is not a bad thing. It, it, all of a sudden, Passover is not. It's trying to teach us something. What's the deal with this? So let's take a look at text 5a. Sorry. Oops. Okay. And text 5a says like this. This is from also from the Talmud. We're told that there was a, a rabbi, Rabbi Alexander, and he would say, Master of the universe, it is revealed and known before you that we want to fulfill your will. That was when he would pray, he would say, You know, God, we're we're good. We mean well. In our internal moral compass is good. And when everything is equal and calm, and I can see and think clearly, you want to do the right thing. And so what prevents us from doing the right thing? He says that what prevents us is the yeast in the dough. He, obviously, it's not yeast, and he's not dough, and it's not yeast. Yeast, the conceptual yeast in the dough, and then he says, and also the impression of the nations, which is a, a, a pretty common theme through ancient rabbinic literature that the inability of Jews to live um, in the same environment, able to choose to with any um, the, the, the autonomy and ability to, to, to breathe and earn a living, that really, it, it, it threw them off balance from just being able to live and therefore to, sometimes to make the right choices because they were under such pressure. So one of the things we find that almost quite a bit is just God, just leave us alone from the anti-Semitism and we'll, 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 we'll have an easier time directing our lives where we want to. That's not what today's uh, lesson is about. It's, he says first, the yeast in the dough. And he, he finish off with his prayer, may be your will, he deliver us from them so we can return to the fulfill the edicts of your will with a perfect heart. So God, please liberate us from anti-Semites and please liberate us from yeast. What what's yeast? He's not saying please, you know, uh, save us from donuts. What's the the yeast? Text five B from a great rabbi of the sixteenth seventeenth century, Ramaral. He says the metaphoric meaning of yeast in the dough is based on Maimonides' teaching in his introductory remarks to Ethics of the Fathers. He writes that in matters of character and conduct, the preferred path is the, the path of the golden mean, the middle path. What the, the Maral, this rabbi, is saying is that Maimonides writes that we should, the ideal is that we should rationally choose the right way to go forward, not be led, led to extremes by impulse, even to good extremes. Just to be able to to look and say something where it should be. Obviously, we have emotions, but to try to guide our emotions and not even in, if we're doing, we have an emotion in a good direction, not to overdo it because when we overdo it, sometimes we cause damage in our wake. And certainly not if, if, if it's emotion pulling us in the wrong direction. So what he goes forward here, the morale, he says, our evil inclination prompts us to indulge in extremes like excessive haughtiness or indulgences. That's the human impulse. The human impulse, if we follow our passions, we will either will end up 
in in a bad spot, take us to the wrong spot, or even if we're headed to a good spot, because we, we get so zealous about it, we get over overdo it, and therefore that also becomes um, self-destructive. We want to be able to not uh, just as yeast makes something grow and and spread around, so not to be to grow out of parameters to keep our life in parameters. Logical, rational parameters, holy parameters. Rabbi Alexandri compares the evil inclination to yeast in the dough because it expands the dough to a state that is much larger than larger than its natural disposition. So, says the yeast in the dough. Therefore, what is the yeast in the dough? The yeast in the dough is our some often powerful and often self. Um, it, it, I want to say self-destructive is probably too hard, but really unhelpful. Impulses and instincts that put, point us, pull us in the wrong direction. Those gravitational pulls. That's the yeast in the dough. So the chametz, the bread, the bagels, in comparison to the matzah, represents this growth of something which is a good thing. But it's it, it um, and bread is a good thing. And food is a good thing, but it's this growth, and sometimes it's not a good thing, and sometimes it's it, it's even instinctively not initially not a good thing. It, it takes us somewhere. Uh, we have a passion for something that we have no business having a passion. For. So, if you looked at text five C, a great rabbi of, of our lifetime, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, the head of Yeshiva University, he writes: Every Jew has two kinds of desires. First, there's the inner desire to fulfill every mitzvah and to avoid all sin. We want to do the right thing. Turn to God, we want to do the right thing. That is our natural, our soul's natural desire. It's not your uh, natural human desire, but that's where we, if we push our, our selfish static to the side, we want to do it. We want to be good. We want to do what God wants. As Rabbi Alexandria said, it is revealed and known before you that we want to fulfill your will and what prevents us, the East and the Dome, the oppression of the nations, which is, which is the, the comment we had before. But then there's a second thing. That's a deep inner desire. And that it's so deep, sometimes we have no idea it's there. Because what the normal opera, human operating uh, system is a second one. The extraneous desires that are influenced by the evil inclination and the oppression of the nations. Then there's things we're just trying to survive. And something looks good. And we want to, and not only survive, we want to have pleasure if it's possible. So those things really take up a lot of space in our uh, field of vision. And the idea of the great morality and self-discipline that, that may uh, be very meaningful to us in a moment of meditation, that kind of goes out the window when something good is sitting in front of you. There's something tantalizing is there. Or there's, or, you know, somebody, somebody stepped on our toe and we want to, we, we, we have an, a, a passionate response. After completing the daily Amida prayer, Rabbi Alexandri would pray that we merit to conduct ourselves in accordance with our inner and true desire to fulfill every mitzvah and to avoid all sin. So Rabbi, Rabbi Soloveitchik, is, to wrap this up, this idea up, Rabbi Soloveitchik is telling us that when we, the Talmud tells us Rabbi Alexandri would say, God, we want to do the right thing, but it's the, the yeast that gets in the way. And please, God, help me with the yeast. He's saying, God, I'm human. I have impulses. I have instincts. In deep inside, I don't want to do the right thing. Help me not be distracted and diverted from the proper path by my by the yeast, by my negative impulses or counterproductive impulses. Now, one of the things yeah. a couple of pages ago that you, they were comparing yeast to ex the expansion into the outer world. Now, uh, expansion to the other world. I'm not, I wouldn't say into the other world. It's it's an expansion beyond its 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 uh, uh, original boundaries, and that's kind of uh, an expansion. It's conceptually, I don't want you to finish, but I just want to make sure we, we're on the same page. Um, it's conceptually, if I have um, a desire to help the homeless, and I'm so passionate that I go steal from my neighbor to help the homeless. <laughs> He goes, I, I just need the money. It, that, that, something's wrong. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that, that's the yeast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I mean, the thing is that expansion, engrossment, whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, is contradictory 
the Yiddishkeit because in Yiddishkeit it says we're supposed to study and learn, That's which expands right. us. So there's not, Torah is not against expanding knowledge base nor, or, nor evolving as human beings. But the, the, as Maimonides would say, it wants to you do it in healthy parameters. Extremes are not a, a very Jewish thing. Because even though a lot of Jews are extreme in different ways, we're good at that. <laughs> but the thing is, it's the idea of trying to say, it's not about, I'm filled with passion. What's the right thing to do? What does God want me to do? So, so the idea of the threat that we that is presented and that we, we face on Passover is what do we do with the yeast? We want to try and stay away from the yeast. And the antidote to the yeast is matzah. Now we actually have two types of matzah, which are, are kosher and Passover. Mm -hmm. There's the poor person's bread, which is for the Seder. But then there's the rich matzah, which isn't for it could it, it actually could be by the Seder theoretically, but not for the myth the mitzvah of matzah. So either of those are acceptable and helpful to us. And therefore, we're going to look at these two poles. There's the dough, the yeast over there, the matzahs over here. The matzahs represent who we need to want to be if we are avoiding. And in order to avoid, and if we are avoiding our inner yeast. So what do those two matzahs represent for us? What does it mean for me to, to be a, a poor person matzah day, have a poor person matzah day, or a rich person matzah day? What, is it, what, is, what would that feel like? Because I know what it means to be a yeasty. Yeast means I just I go wherever my impulses take me. So now I'm not doing that. What's the poor person? Let's take a look at text six. This is from the third of the He says, matzah represents self-discipline and abnegation because it doesn't inflate or rise. Rather, it is submissive and low-key. It is it's a situation where matzah means that we're not focusing and obsessed or controlled by our desires, we submit to our responsibilities. This represents the dissolution and suppression of our outer desires. It is achieved by actively restraining the unfettered expansion of our ego-based desires and opting instead for, for humbleness, the opposite of leavening and rising. Also, matzah is tasteless compared to, to leavened bread. These two concepts go hand in hand. Those who are humble are willing to submit to God, even if they don't understand and enjoy it. They rein in their inclinations and don't indulge their passions. So a person may, might say that, you know something, Wednesday night, there's something really good on TV. I love it. I never miss this, this show. Uh, but there's a Seder. Uh, see, I can't read the Haggadah. I didn't go to Hebrew school. I have no clue. You know, I remember my grandparents say there, and I fell asleep, you know, very quickly. It was boring as anything. So what am I... What, where I want to go, what I want to do is stay home and watch my favorite uh, series. But you know, Jews go to a Seder. So I'm going to find a Seder. I'm going to sign up. I'm going to go. That is, there's where my instinct takes me. And then there's, what we're saying is a pretty, a, a, a simple uh, surrender to something which I don't even understand necessarily, but I'm convinced that it is the correct thing. It's 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 a, a Jewish tradition here. Um, let me go to the chat a second. In practical terms, how should one be determining whether it is a divine soul that is pushing beyond rational versus this really being the animal soul pushing for an extreme passion? That's a really good question. And I would say, and I, if I understand correctly, you know, uh, your question is, but what if there's something really, um, there's something going on, and it, I think it really does, it, it calls for extreme passion, because it's, it's an extreme uh, negativity going on. I would say that any time that we find ourselves um, being pulled to a, an extreme, and, and I'm going to read that as an emotional, emo, emotionally extreme 
um, action, a position, it's good to consult with someone who you trust uh, uh, their vision who shares the values, your values, and says, and, and to say, does this really call for this type of a, of a, a response? Because we're ingenious at fooling ourselves. And therefore, if, if, the, if there's going to be, uh, if, the, if I have a feel that there's a need for here for a, a, what I'm calling an extreme response, which may actually inconvenience or even hurt other people, then I, I before I do that, I really should check. That's the way I would answer that question. Okay. So the matzah, we say, is this surrender poor persons the the poor person's matzo just one the one we have the the wheat and water and no juice or anything else but what is now what is text in text 7a okay text 7a what is the luxury matzo it says if you serve god only out of loyalty without understanding the reason and without deriving pleasure from it, and you still enjoy worldly pleasures, you can possibly slip up and indulge in negative behavior. It's only the power of discipline that keeps you in line. Not so when you serve God because you really understand and truly enjoy it. In this case, your mind and heart will prevent you from transgressing God's will. You have no desire for it. So here, and this is really what the, 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 the lesson is about, and what they call the difference between love and loyalty. So you love someone, and you naturally are, are, are by their side. Now, you're with the person by a, a cocktail party, a, a, a block cocktail party of, of people, and the person uh, is, uh, is acting a little bit like a klutz, spills wine on, on someone else's dress, uh, maybe makes a comment that kind of makes you cringe. So right now, you're not feeling so much the love, <laughs> but but this is not, but this Schmendrick is your, your friend or your spouse, so you're not going to laugh, you're not going to knock, you're going to you're going to emotionally be with that person. That's called loyalty, it, and when the, when you're proud of the person, you don't need the loyalty doesn't have to kick in. It's just the love and and, and the, the pride in the person in this person. But sometimes when it's not when that's not there. We're just it's forget about how I feel right now. If this is he or she is is mine, and I got to stick with, with this person, that's called loyalty. That's and that's the way they framed it here. So here too, let's say I I know a, a guy a psychologist. He loves Pesach. He loves every year. He's looking from Purim. He's looking at about and that. Frankly, I'm, I'm I'm envious of him how much he loves Pesach. I, also, I I like Pesach. He loves Pesach, and he's looking forward to the say they can take all night. He, he doesn't doesn't need any struggle with himself about going to the say there. He's been waiting for the say there since they put away the groggers. He's he's uh, he wants to go to to, to the say there. Contrast that with someone who may very well be showing up here Wednesday night. A big crowd coming. Some people I don't know the names, who just looked at and said, "You know something? I haven't been in a say there in, in forty years, or in thirty years, or I've never been in a say there. I don't know, I, I, I'm, but I'm Jewish. I, I'm going to show up." One is showing up with a sense of beautiful zest and appreciation. One is showing up. I don't know. This is what Jews do. People have said that to me before. I know. I know. What, uh, this is what Jews do. I, I'm a Jew, so tell me what, what goes on here. Like them too. Like like Yom Kippur, like a lot of things, yeah. You know, some people enjoy Yom Kippur. Some people show up because that's what they do. We do. So there's the surrender, which was text six. And text 7a is uh, the idea that there's uh, sometimes it's, it's not a loyalty or surrender. It's because you love it. Now, what's the difference? When you love it, no one has to convince you to go to the same. Next year also. This is what you love. If you showed up to the Seder this year out of surrender, you can't bet your bottom dollar you're showing up next year unless you enjoyed it. Here. How long is the, is the surrender going to last? We're not so sure. It's, it's not a good game plan. 
It's not, it's not, we shouldn't be relying on that for, for its continuity of the Jewish people. Just, just do what your grandparents told you. We want to be able to appreciate it so because we own it. So there's are two poles here. One is the simple matzah, no taste, which represents this surrender to God. It's not about what we appreciate, it's, it's this is humility. And then there's the luxury matzah, we enjoy it. And the luxury matzah, which is also a counterweight to the, the East, is that I, I'm not going to do that extreme thing or that emotional thing or follow that appetite because I love what I do. And what I and I love being who I am, and I love following the track the the track that I follow, and that appetite runs counter to the track I am. So if I love being um, a Jew and I love follow uh, following Jewish law and Jewish practice, and that's part of who I am, and it, I, I enjoy it. So yes, the bacon smells good, and it does, but it's, it just doesn't work for me. Be not because only because listen. You know, I, I'm I'm shackled here. I'm with white knuckles. I really want to have it. it's because I, I I enjoy being who I am, and that runs counter to it. So let's go through seven D. It's also from the Rebbe, text nine. Skip the page. Did I? No, you're right. Seven B. Seven B. You're right. Seven B. Thank you. That is so we're on page two thirty eight. One who serves God with the luxury matzah approach, with understanding and feeling, will not indulge in leavening and negativity, just like luxury matzah, fruit juice matzah can ferment. If, if, we're, if we're really engaged in mind and heart in a certain value or relationship, and we're enjoying it and we're appreciating it, we're not in danger of swerving from it. Serving God with the ordinary matzah approach with discipline and loyalty, but someone who says, "Listen, I don't know, but uh, uh, you know, I, 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 this is it's a relationship, and I have to be loyal to it." That's beautiful, but there, it's it's not as full bodied and as secure as one would think. It allows for the possibility of leavening and negativity, just like ordinary matzah, water and flour has the capacity to ferment. We therefore need to prevent the negativity by not allowing expansion, rising, and leavening through the constant diligence, effort, and self engagement. So I, something I, I, I didn't mention before. Fruit juice, we're told fruit juice and uh, just pure fruit juice, that water. Pure future, fruit juice in, in, uh, in, um, in wheat, flour, cannot ferment. It's only water. So what's the Rebbe saying here? Saying you have Matzah is when you take a species that can ferment. I did, it was mentioned before, but I didn't dwell on it. That, that can ferment, like wheat flour, and you put in water, which can ferment it. If you put in orange juice or, or wine, it can't become hummus. So you think, oh, that's ideal. It's not ideal. We want something that can become hummus, and you don't allow it to become hummus. So the idea of what we have serving God with ordinary matzah, the idea is that we are in a position that's where we need constant diligence. Because if you're in love with your Judaism, you're in love with your Seder, you're not in danger. If you're just going through the, the, the you're doing it because this is what you're supposed to do, that's beautiful, but you are in danger because you your heart's not there. And if your heart's not there, you're open to, to distraction. So matzah with, with orange juice, it, it, it can't become hummus. It's not in danger. Matzah with water, dough with, uh, with water is in danger. It can become hummus. And that's the Rebbe's point in 7b. Now, if you look at text A, and I, I jumped again before. Um, the, the founder of Chabad writes in his book, Tanya, about he's not writing about the exodus per se but he's talking about us and dealing with our, ne our negative passions and inclinations our count counterproductive passions and inclinations it says with respect to the exodus from Egypt the Torah states that the nation fled they, they ran out in the middle of the night right 
On the surface, this is surprising. Why was fleeing Egypt necessary? Was Pharaoh not compelled them to go? Why was there a need to flee? So we said the reason, the reason they did is because they were chased out. It says, but the language of the Torah is that they escaped. But they didn't escape. They were chased out. But the Hebrew of it, Barach, means that they, 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 they ran away. They escaped. So why is that? What is that telling us? The answer is that this was a spiritual escape because their inner negativity and impurity was still strong within them. It did not cease until the Torah was given on Sinai. So what Rabbi Shnazam is saying, look at who the Jews were. The Jews were, be, they had been slaves for centuries. They knew very little about Judaism. They had very little spiritual connection. They were on the, the cusp of really being lost as a people. The Jews who were, who were freed at the, in the Passover story. What we were to know at the time. There was, well, there was a tradition from Abraham and Sarah. It's different, yeah. but there was a Hebrew tradition. Okay. As a matter of fact, what the Talmud says is that what kept them was that they they held on to Jewish names. I mean, you you can be a total shrans uh, with a Jewish name, but it's a, it, it's 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 superficial. But they held Jewish names. They still spoke their language, and there was a Jewish style dress. All external stuff. What, what you say is important, not the language you say, right? But they used a Jewish language, they had Jewish names, and they, they spoke Jewish, so they were, they were holding on to superficial reminders that they were doing. But internally, it wasn't working. It didn't, it didn't resonate with them. So they knew at that point when God pulled them out, God pulled them out of slavery, saying, "You're I, you on your own. You're not even looking for freedom." They were not looking for freedom. They were not looking for spiritual freedom, and they were they had become resigned to their faith. God woke them up. So when they ran, it says they their inner negativity and impurity was still strong within them. We're told that actually they they had become engaged with the Egyptian idolatry, and they took idols out with them as they left Egypt. As they're going into the desert, the Jews were being freed by God. They packed up the idols, not just the, the, the matzah, because this was part of the way they thought. They were slaves. They, 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 they had assimilated so much into their mindset. So what they were trying to do was also to run away internally from their patterns, from their status <laughs> quo, from their <laughs> own inertia. Okay, given that, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would question the last word of that, which is the Torah was given. Yeah. The key is that the Torah was accepted. Excellent. Well said. It was, it, it, it's it, it, excellent. The, the, um, there is an expression of the event. Mm hmm. Which is known as it's Matan Torah when the Torah was given, but the the idea of what happened was that we received it and we accepted it. And so um, it, it, it happens to be what they translated is that it didn't happen until that event of the giving of the Torah. You're right. What the 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 nuance that made it so special was the fact that we accepted it. Well said. Okay. Text nine. From the Rebbe, the words you left the land of Egypt in haste explain why the matzah at your seder table, our seder table, cannot be luxury matzah made with fruit juice or from grains that can't ferment. It is because they left in haste, inasmuch as their ungodly desires were still strong, they needed to fall back on their obedience and self discipline. This corresponds with the poor person's matzah. What the Rebbe is saying is that the theme of Passover night is not luxury matzah, it's surrender. The Jews didn't know exactly what they were doing. The Jews were not educated. The Jews did not have a love for God. The Jews didn't necessarily have a love for Judaism. But they were they were overwhelmed by the idea that there is God. And they were going, they were submitting. Ezekiel talks about the beauty in God's name that to the Jews, you followed me out into the desert. Just out of, you know, just trusting me. 
And it wasn't an edge to, I mean, they, they saw um, God beating up the Egyptians, but the idea is it wasn't an educated trust of God. It was a more of a blinder faith. And that's what was going on the night of, of Pesach. That's not the ideal because come to Sinai, it's not such a blind faith, but this is where it started. So the, the, the faith of the matzah, which and the, the matzah is, the matzah represents this connection we have with God, the, 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 the relationship. It's either the poor persons, which is simple, surrender, loyalty, or it's going to be rich, beautiful, love, appreciation. The Pesach night, the Seder night, it's really about, it, 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 was, it was poor. It was um, basic, fundamental, this is, this is what God says. And this was Abraham and Sarah's God. We're going to go. Now, if you look at text 10, what? Um, in text 10, that if you look at it, before we read text 10, in thinking about this, we should aspire to be the fruit juice matzah. We want to have a, a full-bodied relationship with God. And loyalty is when you don't have it. It's a fallback position. But there's another idea, which is that there's a beauty in the loyalty where it, it's not just a, a fair-weather friend or fair-weather lover. It's even when something is, is bothering me, even when there's a, 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 you're showing a part of you that doesn't turn me on, I'm still, that's beautiful. So there, there's a, a, a wish, which I mentioned in the past, in, in Jewish life, we talk about the three different types of mitzvahs, mitzvahs that are rationally understood, uh, you know, in, instinctively understood. Then misses like Pesach, we say we wouldn't have come up with this on our own, but okay, there was, there was this liberations and matzah, makes sense. And then there's misses that don't make sense. They're super rational. Kosher. Why keep kosher? People can come up with whatever reasons they want, but God didn't give us any reason. So one would think, I think naturally, the misses that we understand, the misses that we can appreciate, are going to be ones where we're, we feel more engaged. We're more drawn to it. The other ones, okay, well, you say so, whatever, <laughs> or not. I don't know. You know, it's not just. It's we, we're rational human beings, and we may not be so so quick to suspend the rational analysis. So the the, the Hasidic wish is it says that we should fulfill the rational mitzvahs with the same sense of surrender with which we fulfill the super rational mitzvahs. In other words, when if I if it really makes sense to me, giving charity makes sense to me. I want to help a poor person. I want to help the homeless. Or um, caring for my parents, it makes sense to me. There, there are things that make sense. So we say, so that, maybe I don't need God to tell me to do that. It makes sense to me. What the Torah tells us is even the things that make sense to you, there should be a, a core element of loyalty there. A core element that even if it didn't make sense to me today, I'm going to do it anyway because this is a mitzvah from God. And the wish is that we should also do the super rational mitzvahs with the zest that we feel in the rational mitzvahs because this is what a loved one told me. If my, I, I care about my wife, and my wife is, is someone I, 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 I've devoted my life to. And she asked me something to, to do something which isn't particularly rational. I can ask a question. But if at the end of the day she says, this is what I want, unless it's immoral or fattening, I'm going to do it. Because uh, I, I, this is, I, I'm, I have a, a, a sense of, of, of commitment and loyalty or surrender to her. So look at if you look at text 10, this is from the founder of, of uh, Chabad. He says, there's an element in the loyal, disciplined Jew that is better than those who have transformed their desires. Although disciplined Jews have yet to transform their desires, they have set themselves and their interests completely aside. 
So here, what, what he's saying is like this, and this is a, a basic Hasidic a, a look, which which made a, a Hasidism unpopular in, in in some observant circles. Let's say that's a college that is just I, I know who I told you about who loves Pesach, and he's chomping at the bits for Wednesday night. He's here, and some Jew comes in here Wednesday nights. Puts on a yarmulke upside down, sits down, and uh, uh, I don't know anything, but I, I showed up because that's what Jews do. If you want to talk about advantage or beauty, spiritual beauty, on the one hand, of course, there's spiritual beauty in someone who who's in in love with a mitzvah. But then again, if someone's in love with a mitzvah. And maybe that it really floats their boat. Some, you know, hey, coming to say there's more about them doing something enjoyable than doing something for God. Right? It's not every person who does mitzvahs is thinking about God necessarily. We're doing, either we're doing what we're trained to do or we're doing what we find enjoyable. And all this. And so it's the, the idea of, of, of uh, me eating uh, kosher. I'm eating kosher that I'm used to it. <laughs> and and I and it's usually tasty stuff. So it's I'm really not putting myself aside. It's not a challenge. Someone who says, you know, I decided that today I'm gonna only eat kosher. I'm gonna go find kosher. I'm not gonna eat in, in, uh, I'm gonna go find myself a a, a, a kosher restaurant today. Just today, not tomorrow, just today. There's more of a religious exercise there than by me, because I'm also eating kosher today. I eat kosher every day, and I don't, I'm not struggling with it. But there's a beauty in the struggle, and because the, the beauty in the struggle is that you've done something, you've given God a gift, saying, God, today I'm not going to go to uh, Taco Bell, I'm going to whatever it is, and uh, uh, kosher deli, because for you, God, that's special. Me, I go to the kosher deli usually because I'm hungry, and I didn't go to Taco Bell because I never thought of going to Taco Bell. It's not, it's not in my, in my it's, it's not in, in, in the calculus. So here, there's a very important point. There's this idea of what they call the loyal disciplined Jew. In other words, the 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 poor, the uh, the matzah of poverty. There's a beauty. It's just surrender to to this is what God wants. And look at text eleven. This is again from the, the Maral. It says matzah is a poor person's bread, which is different from a wealthy person's bread. Luxury bread has oil and honey. It is the rich person's bread because it is enriched by the oil and honey. The poor person has no money, has only himself. Ordinary matzah is a poor person's bread because like the poor person, it has no extras, just flour and water. There are some people there if we're in the right spot, it's just about the God wants me to do it. I'm doing it. It's not that I enjoy it. It's not that it's my calculation. It's not what it does for me. It's it's about you, God. That's that's it's a a mitzvah without frills, no other, no side benefits. Just God. That's the idea of redemption. Redemption means to be free, not to be chained to anyone. Like unlike a slave who is not free to be alone because he's bound to his master. Similarly, wealthy people are not alone. They're bound to their possessions. All the frills we have, they weigh us down too. That's not freedom. A poor person is not, not chained to possessions, is independent of freedom and poor. But the fact is that it's it, there, there's something to be said for that. Spiritually speaking, we're saying that the poor bread is to say, it's, I, I don't need that. It's not about the bells and whistles of the Seder, it's about doing a mitzvah. And, and uh, the bells and whistles are part of the mitzvah. It's, not, it's about the, the joy I'm getting out of it. Text 12. Although there's something special about the complete eradication of a luxury matzah's, the matzah Jews' name. Oh, I'm sorry. God, thank you. Text 12. Although there's something special about the complete eradication of a luxury matzah Jews' negative impulses, there's also something special about the ordinary matzah Jews. Namely this, the fact that they tell or tell continuously to wrestle with their evil inclination control their impulses. There is great joy to, the, to God when we have to wrestle with ourselves and choose to do the right thing. You'd say, wow, it would be better if you don't even wrestle with yourself. You just want to do the right thing. That's great. 
And sometimes we're in a position where we're like that. But the gift to God is when we're doing it for God, not only because we think it's a good thing. Text 13. And that comes with the struggle. Even when we say when Mashiach comes, when, when the... Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the, 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 when we say when the Mashiach comes, there's going to be a great higher consciousness. We'll have a depth of understanding. We'll understand all the mitzvahs. We'll understand. So we're going to be really engaged. And my mind is right to this way. The sages and prophets did not yearn for the messianic era to have dominion over the entire world, to rule over the Gentiles, to be exalted by the nations, or to eat, drink, and celebrate. Rather, they desired it for the freedom to be fully engaged in the study of Torah and wisdom without any pressures or disturbances. At that time, God, good will flow in abundance, and all the delights will be freely available as dust, yet the entire world's sole occupation will be to know God. So at that point, we only need luxury, that's it. There's no need. There, there isn't the, we're not going to have that struggle and wrestle and, 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 and surrender, one would think. But the fact is that we say in Haragada, it's from the Talmud, but it's brought, it's in the Haggadah, at least in all the Haggadahs I've seen. It's that the, the quote of the Talmud that when Mashiach comes, we will celebrate Pesach. We will recall the redemption from Egypt. Who needs to talk about the redemption from Egypt? That's ancient history. With the, 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 the redemption from the exile, with Mashiach, with everything's great. Why do we have to talk about that? Because that element of struggle and surrender is, is a beautiful thing that it will resonate even in the times of Mashiach. And in text 14, we say the primary objective is to serve God in both ways. Even after achieving transformation, complete refinement of the character of character to the point that our added desires are completely eradicated. We still want the benefit of ordinary matzah, like the night of the Exodus, complete submission to God through effort and toil. Oh, Okay. Primary objective is to serve God in both ways. Okay. Read it again. I'm sorry. I missed that one. So in other words, both of those are important. And that's the, the, the point of, of, this, uh, of this lesson is that in life, we want to have both love and loyalty. And while love is an advantage, is obviously is, is, is a premium, the idea of the surrender that comes with loyalty is, 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 has an advantage over just the, the, the pure love element. Let's do key points. Number one, matzah must be made from a dough that can ferment, <coughs> but has been prevented from doing so by our efforts. Number two, we have outer desires for physical pleasure and inner desire for God. Leaven represents our outer desires. Matzah represents our inner desire. Number three, one option is to ignore the outer desire and do God's bidding out of loyalty. This is the ordinary matzah approach. Another option is to develop a love for God and do it for love. This is the luxury of natural approach. Number four, at the time of the Exodus, our ancestors were at an ordinary matzah level, which is why we use ordinary matzah for our seder table. We must have the capacity to ferment and we must prevent it from fermenting. And number five, although serving God out of love is the higher way, there is something special about the unadorned beauty of setting ourselves aside and submitting to God out of loyalty. So I'm going to stop the share. And um, if there's uh, any comments or questions, you can take the higher in. way, not the higher way. Yes. <laughs> and I uh, wish you all a, a wonderful Pesach. We're not next Sunday. We won't be meeting, but we will reconvene. I'll, I'll send out an email, I guess, two weeks from today. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Be well. Enjoy. Good Passover. Very good Passover. Good Passover, Rabbi. Bye bye. <laughs> huh? Why is it not going? <laughs>